Hey, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it's episode number 188 of Goulet Q&A. I've had a pretty busy, pretty interesting last week. Um, see here, we went up to uh, Rachel's parents' place. They're about two hours north of us, um, and went to a place called Cox Farms. If any of you are from the D.C. area, you may know that place. It's kind of a... Um, you know, well, it's a farm, and uh, they have all kinds of, you know, slides and hay rides and pumpkin patch and apple cider donuts and all that good stuff. So we had a lot of good time uh, with the family there. It was really cool. It's kind of, I guess, become somewhat of a tradition of ours to go there uh, with Rachel's family every every uh, like fall. So uh, that was really cool. We ended up missing out last year because uh, Rachel had her surgery around that time, but we went this year. It was a lot of fun. Got to spend good time with them. The kids loved it. It was really really cool. Um, I'm still kind of like trying to wrap my head around anything because literally yesterday afternoon Rachel and I went to uh, a follow-up with her nutritionist that uh, you know Rachel's been on a pretty restricted diet and has had a lot of health things going on um, you know I've been I've been trying to walk with her in that and so I've done somewhat of her diet um, but the thing that I've learned through her nutritionist is that um, there's a lot of very specific things related to like bio individu individuality is the approach they take. Um, so anyway, I want to get into the dirty details, but long story short, I've been going with her all year to these appointments and eventually it was to the point like, all right, I'm on this diet, but I know it's like specific to her and all this kind of stuff. So let me get myself kind of assessed. I haven't had like major health problems or anything like that. I've been like tired and stressed and stuff, but that I've had life going on, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I go to this appointment yesterday, not really knowing what to expect. And I get tested for all this stuff. And uh, as it turns out, I have uh, Epstein-Barr, which is the monovirus. I, you know, apparently like 90% of adults are carrying around Epstein-Barr. Uh, go figure. So I have mono. Uh, I have uh, candida, which is like yeast within your body. Um, no symptoms really, but I've got it. Uh, and then I have, what else? Uh, strep in my body as well. Uh, and something called leaky gut. So... Uh, I'm kind of a hot mess actually come to find. Uh, I haven't really been showing any symptoms, but um, I've had like rashes and stuff that are broken on me. I said I wouldn't get into details, but you know, just uh, all of my stuff, like Rachel has, has struggled with anxiety and a lot of her symptoms manifest towards anxiety. Mine all manifest uh, towards histamine. So like allergy related stuff. And I'm like, huh, and like tiredness and weight gain and all this kind of stuff. I have like insulin issues in my pancreas or pituitary or something like that. Anyway. <laughs> Long story short, I am now on a super restricted diet. Like I can't eat any grains except for brown rice. Uh, I can't have any farm raised meat. I can only have wild caught like boar and fish and stuff like that. Um, I'm restricted on uh, basically all vegetables except for nightshades like squash and uh, tomato and stuff like that. Um, I can only have almonds as a nut, nothing else. I can have seeds. Um, I can't have any sweeteners except for monk fruit. Uh, I can't, and it's just all this stuff, and I'm like, the only fruit that I can have is apples in two weeks, uh, papaya, guava, and kiwi. So I'm like, oh, okay, what am I gonna eat? Oh, no dairy, uh, except for cream cheese, and, and like half and half. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I'm like literally trying to wrap my head around. I have this printout and everything, and I've got these supplements I'm supposed to take. To, it's to get all this stuff out of my body. Um, but apparently that is why I've been holding on to weight so much, even though I've been exercising and doing well and stuff like that. Uh, my body just has apparently all these things that I've been carrying around with me for probably quite some time. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. So uh, Rachel was kind of like, wow, I didn't realize you were actually so sick. And I was like, huh, I guess I've kind of been like mentally powering my way through it. But like, yeah, now that I think about it, it has been kind of wearing on me. So anyway. I only share all of this with you, partly because that's like completely on my mind right now, um, but also because that's just where I'm going to be at. If you follow me personally on Instagram or anything like that, and you see me taking pictures of any of my meals, they will not be flattering because <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be eating like brown rice with bison on it and that's it. You know, just like super restricted kind of stuff. But I'm going to make the most of it um, on this regimen for the next 90 days. And, uh, you know, right during Christmas time, which is going to be great, I can't have chocolate, I can't have anything sugar, I can't have oats, I can't have... So, like, all the Christmas goodies, can't have a lick of them. So, 
go figure. I'm probably gonna lose a ton of weight, which is why I share this in Q&A is because I'm probably going to look very different two or three months from now, but go figure. I've already lost 14 pounds just in the last six weeks, just from kind of quasi doing Rachel's portion of the diet, which now I'm even more uh, strict on that. So uh, losing weight really is all about your food. Uh, exercise builds muscle, but we, uh, diet loses, loses weight. So we will see, this will be a journey for me. I've watched Rachel and several of her family members go through this thing and it's been pretty amazing, um, the transformation that can happen. And I didn't think I was that sick, but apparently I am. Go figure. So who knows what I'm gonna be like in a couple of weeks. But anyway, you'll get to see You'll get to see the journey, so it'll be fun. That's why I share it with you all. Um, so, you know, I'm on this strict regimen. I'm on a strict thing, so I appreciate any, like, emails that you all send me of support and all this kind of stuff, but I know with what I've shared already, sometimes I get like, oh, you should try this thing. Oh, this random thing worked for me. That's cool. That's great. But I'm on a strict thing that I have to stick to. So you can send me all the recommendations of articles and health things you want, but I'm going to largely ignore everything that everybody sends me because I'm on a very specific plan towards me right now. Uh, but anyway, it should be should be a journey. So let's talk about some more pen stuff, huh? Um, so Q and A last week got some really really good feedback in the comments. Man, that stuff is like that feeds my soul. So that was really cool. I had a lot of good, nice, meaty topics in Q&A last week, and uh, I kind of laid it out there with some somewhat, you know, touchy subjects, and I just wanted to take them head on, um, and you all responded with great feedback, seriously. So thank you so much for that. Really good stuff about Real Talk about the Monza. Got some really good back and forth on some of that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next several weeks, couple of months, to see how it goes. Um, but, uh, you know, for sure, every product we carry, we want feedback on that. So thank you for that talking about Visconti nibs and stuff like that, um, you know, and suggestions about what to do there uh, is really good. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's feedback there. And then just a lot of suggestions about like what to do with videos and dual cam suggestion, more guest spots, short pen reviews, all that kind of stuff. Um, me and the whole media team, we're looking at a lot of the suggestions you all gave, and we're gonna be talking about that kind of stuff, um, especially as we're gonna be bringing a videographer on soon. We've just kind of finished the interview process. We're in the process of selecting and and uh, you know eventually onboarding uh, a new videographer. So we'll, we'll keep that up to date once we have more information forthcoming, but we're all very pumped about that. So a lot of the suggestions you all had were like, yeah, this all sounds great. We just haven't had the resources to do it. So um, that'll be forthcoming though. So I'm excited for that. Um, and then uh, that'll be really good. And then we also uh, hired a new senior inventory specialist. So this is this is somebody who is really behind the scenes. You're not really going to know uh, them at all. Um, but uh, I'll look to do more once we've kind of finalized more. We literally have just kind of finalized the offer and stuff this week. But um, you know that's been an open position we've had since April, May. Uh, we take a while to find uh, people, especially if they're specialized and looking for the right person. So we are we are a higher slow kind of company. But anyway, uh, so that's really cool. And then uh, we're gearing up for the holidays. You know, this is a busier time. We're gonna have Thanks Giveaway that's starting next week. We have some really cool stuff in the works. Fountain Pen Day is coming. And then things are gonna start rolling for us. So there's an energy in the building here that's gonna start to really pick up. Uh, and we're gonna, we have so many product launches that have been pushed back and pushed back. And it's like getting into crunch time. So we're telling all of our distributors and manufacturers like, hey, you guys don't want to miss the holidays. Like, get your stuff in here. So I think you're going to see a, kind of an explosion of new stuff come out in November, early December. So uh, be ready for that. A lot of cool, exciting stuff. Not a lot of it I can share yet because it's kind of super under wraps on some of these things. But um, I will definitely look to share as stuff comes out. I have one really exciting thing that is beginning today as of when this video publishes, obviously. Um, so on the 27th. Um, so we are running a contest for the next week to give away, um, and it is a really cool collaboration that we are doing with Kenro, which is Monograppa's uh, U.S. distributor. Um, so working with them and Jake Weidman, my big, you know, I'm a fanboy of his, um, I'm an artist and master penman. So Jake, um, we you know we met in D.C. back in August, and he's been working with Monograppa. He's been doing some really cool you know stuff with the copper mule pens and just kind of doing some engraving and kind of like expanding that as a, as a medium of his. And so we were kind of riffing and just coming up with ideas. And I was like, hey, why don't we do like a joint giveaway thing? And you know he has an engraved pen. I was like, hey, if you're willing to engrave a pen, we could do it. We could kind of you know get some cross pollination of our audio 
audiences together. So hopefully a lot of you in the fountain pen world can become more aware of Jake and his talent. He's getting into more into kind of the pen world a little bit. He's got a lot of his artists and stuff who might not know about fountain pens. So we're hoping to um, get some, some nice collaboration going on there. So what he did um, is he took one of his art pieces, um, which uh, is this beautiful um, feather quill thing here. Um, and he is actually providing one of these for the giveaway. Um, but even more exciting than that is he has used that piece as inspiration for a custom engraving uh, for a copper mule pen. Um, so uh, it is a one of a kind piece that is a copper mule, which is already a really nice pen. Um, but I want to show you his hand engraving because it is pretty rad and I'm super jealous because I am not eligible in the contest, nor is anyone here at Goulet, but uh, this is the engraving. This is all done by Jake by hand um, that matches that art piece. Really cool. And he's kind of like darkened the feather part to be black and um, just really awesome stuff. Now it is copper, so it'll patina and stuff over time. You got to polish it up and whatnot, but um, fine detail. I mean, Jake's work is just incredible. And he's literally like testing out, learning how to do engraving, and this is his stuff. So this is kind of somewhat of a, I'm going to consider it to be a, a mildly historical piece just because in the fountain pen world, he's just kind of getting into it. You know, I want him to stick around and be in this community for a while. So I don't know, uh, you know, how important a piece like this could be, but certainly as an artist and as anybody collecting his work, some of his earlier pieces as he expands a new repertoire um, will become more valuable over time. So um, this one is being given away in the contest for free. So definitely make sure you sign up for that. We have full details on our blog uh, and I'm just going to be super jealous of whoever wins. So uh, anyway, you get the pen and the print. It's pretty cool. And th really the kind of coolest part about all of it is um, Carrie Yeager, who um, has just been a pen enthusiast for years, decades, um, really was kind of the champion of Fountain Pen Day, which is Friday next week, November 3rd. He, um, he really has been the champion. We've been working close with him as the Fountain Day Pen Day was forming. Um, and uh, he basically, through his passion and going to all the pen shows and doing the Fountain Pen Day promotion stuff, linked up with the folks at Kenner. He actually works there full time now promoting pens and being involved in the community. So he has helped to kind of pull this together and pull me and Jake together um, with him and the other folks at Kenro. So it's really just been like this cool mix of just stuff that's happened and ideas that came about to create this really cool contest centered around Fountain Pen Day to celebrate it, bring a master penman like Jake to the community, you know, bring our audience and everything that we've got here together to just kind of get it all in the mix. So I'm just, I'm honored to be a part of this whole thing. So make sure you do that. Make sure you share it out with your friends um, too, to be able to enter into this contest contest. It's just really cool to, to be a part of something like this. So anyway, super pumped about that. Um, so uh, Fountain Pen Day is going to be next Friday. We are looking to run some deals. Um, so make sure that you're signed up for our newsletter. Make sure that you're watching our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Um, so that you can be aware of everything that's going on there. <clears throat> so that should be pretty exciting. Um, and then just some other new products that we're going to have coming up. The Aurora 88 Minerali, the next color, the diopside in green. Um, that one's coming on November 1st is kind of the official release of that in the U.S. So be on the lookout for that. We have some um, Goulet cards, you know, just like the, the regular thank you cards, note cards that we have. Um, you know, ones like these. They're slightly small. They're somewhat close to a 3x5 size now. Um, and we sell some of them, but uh, we are looking to do up a larger 4x6 size, specifically for the holidays, um, so that, uh, you know, a lot of you who want to send something postcard size, or if you wanted to put it into a kind of a standard size envelope, you'll be able to do that. We tried to source out envelopes, and we just weren't able to test them and all that and kind of get, you know, get something uh, like that for the holidays. But we do, of course, sell, you know, Crown Mill and Triumph and, and other, like, 4x6 note cards. So we figured if we went, or envelopes, sorry. So I figured if we went with more of a standard size note card, you could then get whatever envelope that you are already happy with um, and use it for that or you could use it as a standard postcard so we'll have that coming out soon be on the lookout for that on our site 
Um, we have Thanks Giveaway that's going to be starting next Wednesday. We have lots of awesome prizes for that, and we're going to tweak it, do it a little bit differently this year. I'm not going to spoil it yet. Um, I'll talk about it more in detail next week, but um, be on the lookout for that on our blog and our newsletter uh, next week. And then uh, just a couple other things, you know, the Monteverde, the Noir ink set, like the 10-piece ink set, has actually, you know, done surprisingly well for us. We, we didn't know what kind of demand there was for a full ink set like that because it's been kind of mixed with other brands, um, but it did surprisingly well. So um, we had the opportunity to do, um, you know, in the gemstone um, as well as the core set. So uh, we went ahead and did up a 10-piece set uh, for the other two Monteverde uh, ink lines. So those will be coming out soon for those of you who are excited about that. And then um, there's a pen I talked about a while ago, the Pilot Custom Yurushi. And uh, there was a lot of confusion about it because I had some misinformation in my own mind and there was confusion amongst our team about how different this pen was than the Pilot custom 845 Yurushi and we got a little bit confused. So I have the pen in hand now and I wanted to show it to you quickly before I get into the rest of the questions just because this pen is freaking huge. Okay, so it comes in just a black kind of generic box, right? And the pen itself is massive, okay? Now I have big hands. So maybe you're like, oh, that looks kind of like a normal size pen. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of other pens uh, to compare it to just so you get an idea of the size. So here is the custom Yurushi. Now it is a uh, pen that is coated in Yurushi lacquer. That's kind of the whole point. It also has a fairly sizable nib, which I'll show you in a second. So to eliminate any confusion, here is the Pilot Custom 845 Yurushi, which looks very similar, but clearly the size is quite different. Uh, quite, quite different. So very similar in style, almost identical. When you're seeing it just in pictures on white on the internet, you can't really tell unless you see a comparison here. So that's why I wanted to show you here. For another you know, visual comparison here, this is a Mont Blanc 149, which is commonly known as a very large pen. It is larger than the Mont Blanc 149. It's 149. It's larger both in diameter and in overall size than the 149. Um, another pen to compare it to is the Delta Dolce Vita Oversize, which is an incredibly fat, incredibly large pen. Um, here it is next to the Delta Dolce Vita Oversize. It's about the same girth as a Dolce Vita, but uh, it's clearly longer and bigger. So, uh, very impressive, girthy, large pen. Uh, <laughs> Sounds weird, but I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and just show you some of the features here. So it's resin pen, 18 karat gold nib. The nib is huge. Um, Pilot uses their own kind of custom sizing uh, for their nibs. Uh, they call it a number 30 size, which is um, the size nib that's on the um, Yukari Royale, the large pen there. Um, just for comparison here, here's a custom 74 just for comparison of the nib size. The Custom 74 is approximately a number five size nib. So it's this is probably closer to like a number eight size nib typically um, to give you an idea of what's there. If you uh, like the Mont Blanc 149 and uh, want uh, to see how the nib compares there, it's slightly wider at the base, uh, the nib uh, than a 149. Um, tiny bit longer. So it's actually a little bit bigger nib than the Mont Blanc 149. So here's a 149, custom Yurushi. Um, very big, very, very big nib. Uh, and then let me show you the um, Delta Dolce Vita oversize as well. So it's bigger than the Dolce Vita oversize nib too. Um, and then let me show you just how it compares to the custom 845 Yurushi. It's a little twin here. So you can see quite a bit bigger than that. So this is closer to like a number six size nib. Um, and then this is more like a number eight size. So definitely bigger, um, very similar in style though. Overall, you can see how one might get confused seeing pictures of the two pens online. Um, but the pen is um, rather sizable. Um, it is a uh, uh, converter, cartridge converter pen, comes with the, the um, Con 70, which you can use any of the cartridges or converters in there. Um, large pen, given its size, the weight is actually not too bad. It's, uh, it's actually not quite as heavy 
as any of these other larger, the Marblock 149 or the Delta Dolce Vita Oversize. Um, and just to give you an idea of like the length of it too, you know, another big pen is the Visconti Opera Master. Um, and it's uh, about the same length as an Opera Master, but a little bit girthier. So it is a large pen. Of course, the Opera Master is way heavier. Oh, I wanted to show you the size of the nib in comparison to a Pilot Metropolitan, just because it's kind of funny to see. Whee! Look at that. Very, very large nib. So we'll try and get some good pictures that'll show this off. Um, but it's just a really cool pen. It's huge. The nib is gorgeous. I think it's a fantastic writer, and it just it's a great pen. It is a little pricey. It's up in the $1,400 range. Um, so it's not for the faint of heart, but... Um, it is very cool and I wanted to show it since I actually finally have it on my, this is the first time I've literally held this pen uh, today, uh, is, is today, I mean. It's also the first time I've held it today, but also ever. So very cool pen, great craftsmanship. I mean, Pilot just, Namiki does, I mean, Pilot Namiki, all of them just do a fantastic job. Great pens. So now you have a little more knowledge and education in your brain. All right. Let's start off with the questions, shall we? Because I've already spent a lot of time <laughs> before I've even gotten to the questions. And I have eight of them today. So let's roll. Starting out with pen and writing questions, uh, Carl K on Facebook says, I'm constantly amazed at the new fountain pens appearing in the market. Unusual creative designs, colors, and materials. These are works of art. Do you ever talk to the actual designers of these pens? What do they say? Um, I do talk to them sometimes. It really depends on the company. Um, if it's a really large global company like Pilot, you know, for example, um, the chances of me actually talking to the designer of a specific pen is lower just because I am less of a, you know, factor to them because uh, they have so many retailers across the world. Um, I may not get a chance to meet them individually. And you can imagine if there are literally thousands, maybe tens of thousands of retailers across the world, I'm one of them. So, you know, not I, my team, you know what I mean? I represent one. Uh, if every designer talked to, you know, even a fraction of all the retailers whenever they designed a specific pen, they would have no time to actually do their job. So um, it's something that sometimes I'll get the opportunity to meet somebody there, but uh, usually it's the case with smaller manufacturers um, that I'll get a chance to do that. Like, you know, Edison Pens, Brian Gray, talk directly with him, you know, on a pretty regular basis. Nathan Tardif of Noodler Zinc, a little more regular basis. Um, smaller companies like Keras Customs, um, Twisby, Visconti, uh, they're not as small as some of these other ones I've talked about here, but uh, you know I've been able to talk at times to those who are involved. The thing that I've learned, especially with larger pen companies, is you know they'll have uh, a divide and conquer kind of mentality. So they might have certain individuals that develop certain types of pens or champion certain types of designs. Um, but oftentimes, uh, it's a group effort, right? It's a team teamwork that's involved in designing these pens, or they may design certain amount of elements. You may have engineers, you may have aesthetic designers. So it's not necessarily like one person that's designing an entire pen from start to finish. So it's hard to say like who you actually talk to and stuff like that. But I'm usually involved somewhat uh, in talking to someone uh, whenever I talk to um, these manufacturers. So um, think about like Monteverde, Conklin, you know, Stipula, these other brands. So I've, uh, I've had interaction with those who are involved in the decision making process, if not designing, if not engineering or something like that. Um, you know, and then there's other brands. I know you asked specifically about pens, but I'm thinking like Knock and Robert Oster. You know, I speak with them more directly and it's, I'm always fascinated to do that just because, you know, there is a design element too, but there's a whole other just business operation side of it and marketing and everything and because you know I'm involved in a lot of different parts of how to do that um, especially having grown up our company from just me and Rachel I've had my hand in a lot of it so if I want to talk about fulfillment if I want to talk about shipping if I want to talk about uh, marketing or customer service or any of that stuff I can be engaged in all those conversations because I live it so um, that's really cool I like being able to do that you know brands that are larger like pilot for example you know they're I don't know exactly what their their top line is but it's probably over a billion dollars worldwide I would imagine um, so very very large company um, you know I was able to tour pilot USA just the US distributor and that just blew my mind. You know, they have a 250,000 square foot facility. It's just amazing to see. Um, so, you know, how much of that am I going to be able to influence? You know, very, very little. Um, but I provide my feedback and stuff like that. So there's a whole kind of um, feedback loop that goes on with these larger brands. 
Um, you know, so like Pilot, Lamy, Faber-Castell, Pelican, these larger global brands, um, slightly less involved <laughs> and directly with those. Um, but I'm more involved with U.S. distributors and stuff like that because that's just the way that they manage the, the communication flow. It's, it's a fascinating process. Everybody does it differently, you know, and, and that's where you really get to see how the culture kind of comes out too, you know, because it's like, you know, certain uh, cultures. You know, I'm thinking specifically like Germany and Japan, very like quality driven, a little more conservative, a little classic in their styling and stuff like that. So they might take a pen model and come out with new colors and do like more of an iterative kind of thing. Whereas you have Italian brands, you know, like Visconti, for example, they just, they like to dream up and create kind of new things just, just all, you know, much more um, uh, regularly, uh, for example. So it's, it's just really interesting to see how culture is a part of it, to see individual designers may have an influence in it too. Um, and just how quickly things will turn around and uh, it's really cool. So, and if you, you know, look at like most of the American companies tend to be like wilder in their colors and, you know, more risk taking and stuff like that, especially if they're smaller. So, um, you know, it's just, it's really cool to be involved, you know, in that, in that process all together in whatever capacity I can. Um, but uh, it's always fascinating <coughs> uh, to see that. Okay, whoops, let's get down to my notes to the next question. Um, yeah, I think that that about covers it. You know, most you know when I've been able to speak directly with people that are designing stuff, it's amazing how how down to earth most of them are. You know, and uh, you know specifically you're dealing with people that have been in the pen industry for a long time, been designing pens for a while. They have a pretty good sense of what's going on uh, in the pen world. Um, and what I found as I've gotten more and more into like manufacturers and distributors and other people involved like in the business, um, a lot of them have been working at other companies in the past and have moved around, and so there's just really kind of tight-knit community even within manufacturers and distributors. A lot of them know each other um, and, and stuff like that, especially if you talk about the brands that are really geographically close to each other, like a lot of the Italian brands, like they all know each other like really well. Um, so it's just interesting to see how the relationships there can influence certain things. Um, and just as we've grown here with Goulet Pens, the influence that we have, um, putting out all the, all the videos and education and just the engagement we have with you all as a community, um, that is something that I've, I've come to find over the last eight years. Um, I'm, I'm getting to have more of a say or more of a seat at the table um, with some of these manufacturers about you know what's a customer sentiment and what is the design you know impact and feedback and stuff like that and and so I'm getting to engage in more of those conversations that I'm really enjoying um, so it'll be really interesting to see how that develops even in future years all right next question is from cam B on Facebook when you upgrade from steel to gold nibs, are nib sizes equivalent? What differences can we expect? Um, so I do get asked about like gold versus steel nibs quite a bit, um, especially if you're a you know, newer pen user and you see there's such a price discrepancy um, between a steel nib and a gold nib. Um, the thing that I can say with some of them is um, it's not always uh, so easily to compare because not all brands have literally like the same nib just the only difference is that it's made out of gold instead of steel you know i think uh, there are some brands like that for sure like um, you know edison for example sells you know the number six size steel nib and then you can get the exact same nib in gold you can literally swap it out um, very simple to compare the two because really all else is the same when you get into other brands like pilot for example they have a Metropolitan or like the Prera, you know, that nib that's used on those pens, they don't make an exact gold size equivalent of that nib. You know, they have like a Custom 74, they have something that's somewhat similar, but it's not like literally a direct swap. Um, or you have Lamy, for example, they have their steel nib, they have their 14 karat gold nib, which can be swappable with the steel, so that's somewhat of a comparison. But then their Lamy 2000 nib is really just a completely different design altogether. There's no steel version of a Lamy 2000 nib. So if you're looking at going like, I have a Safari and I'm looking to compare it to a Lamy 2000. It's really like, yes, you have gold as a factor in there, but it, the whole design of the nib is completely different and the grind is different. So it's not always a direct comparison just with the, the nib material. So I'll try to try to nuance it a little bit um, here, but it's not always such a one-to-one. -one. Um, so uh, really what you'll end up finding, the grind itself, um, you know, has to be looked at uh, uh, you know, by model, pretty much. Um, if there is a nib type that's the same, like for Edison, for example, um, they have their their steel and they have their gold nibs. Um, you know, then you can look and say, okay, really, there's much more of a direct comparison. So, you know, with that, I usually find that the gold nibs tend to write a little wetter, tend to be a little broader. Just all else equal, 
just because, if for no other reason. Because usually what you're dealing with with gold is you have a little bit of spring, a little bit of give to it, and whenever you have a little bit of give, that if you're riding with any significant amount of pressure, it can open up those tines a little bit and increase the flow. So you end up with a, just a wetter riding experience. Um, a lot of the reason that's a lot of the reason why people like gold nibs is because it feels smoother. You don't necessarily have to press hard, so you can pr you can press a little bit lighter and and it gives a little spring, a little bounce to it, so it just feels a little better. Um, but it also can give. Um, you know, if you're if you're riding and, and, and varying your pressure, not a lot, not like trying to flex it out, but just a little bit, um, it can it can make it flow a little bit wetter, uh, make it just kind of give it a different experience. It can make your ink look a little deeper, a little more saturated, and that kind of stuff. So it's really it's really kind of a preference thing. It's kind of like if you're playing tennis or golf or something like that. It's like if you're starting out playing tennis and you're using a $20 racket, okay, that's fine. If somebody gives you a $1,000 racket, are you gonna be any better? Probably not. You're gonna be like, oh, this is definitely a nicer racket, but is it gonna make you play tennis any better? Probably not, you know, or golf clubs or something like that. It's like if you if you are just kind of starting out and are not like really, really kind of refined in your understanding of how it feels, you're not gonna notice as much of a difference, right? Um, but if you have been using pens a lot and you have a really good sense of it, you know, then you're gonna appreciate it more. Or like if you're drinking a fine wine, like I literally can't tell the difference between a $20 bottle of wine and a $200 bottle of wine. Not that I've had a lot of $200 bottles of wine, um, but uh, I really can't tell the difference. So I don't buy $200 bottles of wine because I can't tell the difference. So um, it's the same kind of thing with nibs. Like you just gotta use what makes sense to you. If you end up being able to experience a nicer nib or um, a gold nib or something like that and you like that, I would kind of look at it almost a little bit more in isolation than just, oh, if I buy a gold nib, it will be better for me. You know, it'll be a better nib. Yes, probably, but not necessarily for everyone, which is why there's so many opinions out there. So it's for these reasons that there's so many different factors. What I b both love and hate about the fountain pens is um, they have to be, they, they can be individualized and personalized so much, but also it can be difficult to kind of sort it out and understand what is best for you. So um, that was a lot of the motivation behind the Nib Nook tool that we have on our site is because literally it's like, Every pen model, every nib size is really kind of in its own league. And, uh, you know, being able to have a, a standardized writing sample of all of them and compare them, uh, I thought would be great. So that's why we do the nib nook and keep it updated. So check that out on our site if you really are curious. All right, next question is from Potter and Pens in, on Instagram. Why is it that pens from different companies feel different? even though they've been ground the same way by the same Nibmeister. Do different companies use different tipping materials, uh, which makes a difference in the feel of the nib? So this is really interesting because it kind of piggybacks a little bit off the previous question of like different models and stuff like that. But now you're saying like, if we eliminate some of those variables and you literally have the same customization that's done, like why do two pens feel differently? So part of it, can be kind of what I just talked about. Like it can be the amount of bounce, flex, spring, whatever you want to call it, that a particular nib has. For example, I'm thinking like, you know, uh, platinum nibs, the Lamy 2000, um, those nibs are relatively stiff. So you are not going to get the same bounce and spring as you do from say a Pilot Custom 74. It's got a decent amount of spring to it. Um, or a Pelican M1000. Like it's just, it's the nib's got a lot more give on it. So all else equal, the nib feels a little bit different when you write because it's like it's like driving a sports car with really stiff suspension versus driving, you know, my 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 parents have a um, what's their car? A Mercury Grand Marquis, right? <laughs> so it's like if you're driving a Corvette, it's gonna feel different than a Grand Marquis. Granted, there's a million different factors that make those different, but just the suspension will make the ride feel differently, I guess, if that makes sense. But anyway, you get what I'm saying. So it's the same kind of thing. The nib give kind of is like suspension on your car, sort of. Um, so that's some of what you're dealing with. Uh, but definitely, you know, I've talked to some nib meisters and stuff like that when they're grinding nibs. And yes, the tipping material that's used on different pens can be different. And that's something that nib meisters need to learn and nuance and get experience with um, when they're doing their thing is because there are some brands where the tipping materials are really, really hard. You know, it's much harder than other uh, brands. And typically, the finer 
the pen, the nicer, more expensive the pen, the harder the tipping is going to be. That's not a one for one rule, but generally speaking, one of the things you do when you're trying to save money manufacturing a pen is you use less of the rare, harder materials in the tipping. Granted, it doesn't save a ton, but I'm saying like if you're buying something like a Jin Hao, you know, or whatever, that you can assume that the tipping is not gonna be the same as on a Pelican, right? Um, now, when you get into like tipping and all that kind of stuff, I get zero information from manufacturers about what kind of tipping they use or anything because it's super proprietary and they don't want to give anything away. Um, so I have no idea who's using the same as who's. This is just feedback I've gotten from uh, Nibmeisters who do grinding is that it's amazing the difference in, in the softness and how long it takes to grind certain nibs just because of the hardness of the tipping material. So yeah, it's absolutely possible. When you talk about a Nibmeister, I mean, yes, Nibmeisters, uh, depending on who they are, they can have a lot of experience and stuff like that, but they might also, um, you know, do something slightly different from one to the other. Now, they're not robots, you know, this is all hand work we're talking about here. And depending on what the original grind is like and all this kind of stuff, you might, um, you might just get a little bit different experience uh, with a fine nib on a Lamy 2000 versus a fine nib on a Pelican, you know, for example. Um, there's gonna be a little bit difference there. Um, so ultimately, that's part of why you have Nibmeisters is they know these pens really well. And if you're going for something that specifically towards a, a, a specific writing style or something like that, give them that information. Say, I have this Pelican M1000. I love the way that it writes. I want it to write exactly like this. Can you make my Pilot Custom Yurushi write the same way? Or whatever, right? Um, and I'm using very expensive pen examples here, but uh, you know that's, that's the kind of information you give them and they can best try to emulate it. So. That's all I got for you there. I'm not an Nibmeister, but I, uh, I have friends who are. <laughs> all right, next question is from Suaro R on Facebook. Besides plastic and ebonite, can any other material be used for making fountain pen feeds? Can we ever expect something like an all metal nib and feed unit? Um, so basically, it used to all be ebonite, really. Um, ebonite is basically a hard rubber, uh, very, um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a material that, uh, oh gosh, the name of it is failing me right now, but it basically is slightly porous and it assists in capillary action in the ink flow. What is the name of it? Hygroscopic. Um, it's a hygroscopic material, and so it's, uh, it assists in ink flow. Um, for economic reasons, basically, and uh, mass production reasons. Um, ebonite is not used nearly as much now as injection molded plastic feeds. So plastic feeds are prominent across most pen brands these days. Um, theoretically, could you use a different material? Yes, I mean, I don't see why not. Um, if you can use plastic, you could use a whole heck of a lot of other things, probably. Um, in terms of being able to actually manufacture them and will they be economical and will there be any, honestly, any significant benefit to doing that over, say, a plastic feed or ebonite especially? Probably not, especially if you're talking about a metal feed. I mean, that might be an interesting thing uh, for somebody who does a lot of metal working, you know, to be able to experiment with. I have never come across anybody that I've seen that's done that. I think literally all I've ever seen has been plastic and metal and uh, ebonite. I've seen some pens that um, have had glass, uh, but it's not a typical thing. It's really like a glass pen with a reservoir. It's not a traditional fountain pen feed. Uh, that would be very difficult to do out of class. Um, so yeah, I mean, theoretically, I don't see why you couldn't have one out of metal, but the process of machining something that's that fine uh, with that many intricate details, if you pull out a pen feed, it's actually rather complicated. Um, to get something that's that fine would, would, be, would be difficult to do out of metal um, and probably way too expensive to be worth it at all. I don't know, it might be interesting. Maybe I can suggest that as a random pen idea for some super special limited edition thing. Um, you know, the only thing that I've seen that, that isn't any, isn't substantially different, like, you know, I've seen on some of the Pilot, uh, or sorry, the Namiki, you know, Yurushi pens, the Makie pens, um, is they will have an, a Yurushi coated ebonite feed. 
but that's not that's still a substance that you have at night. So um, that's interesting. I've I did a little bit of research, wasn't able to dig super deep. So I'm curious if any of you have ever heard of any other materials being done. Um, I'd be interested to know. Theoretically, sure, but I don't know that it would ever be practical to do. All right, HRHO on uh, 1501 on Instagram. You've probably been asked this before, but if you can afford your grail pen, but have a small collection, would you get the grail or focus on exploring more diverse, less expensive pens so as not to plateau? So this is a tough question and one that is gonna be very individualized, very personal. So I'm just gonna speak very much from kind of my own background and experience here. Um, it's going to depend a lot on the situation, so I'm just going to ask a number of questions for you to kind of ponder. Um, like what kind of collection are you looking to build up? You say small is at three pens and you're looking to get it to six, or is small 40 pens and you want to get it to 100? You know what I mean? Like it's going to be very relative there. Um, how expensive is your Grail pen? Literally some people a Grail pen is a Twisby 580 or a VAC 700R. That's, that's not unusual for me to hear about. Or Pilot Falcon or Lamy 2000, you know, even. Some other people, you know, their, <laughs> their grail pen is a Pilot Custom Urushi or the, um, you know, Namiki Emperor Torimon that I showed last week. That's their grail pen. Very different, you know, if you have, you know, you can have a, a collection of Lamy 2000s and Pilot Vanishing Points, for example, but then your Grail pen can be a $5,000 pen. So it's just going to be very different depending on what you're talking about. Um, if you don't, uh, for me, I think a question to think about is if you don't actually love your Grail pen, if you get it and it doesn't quite live up, how easy would it be to sell it or recoup that money? You know, if your Grail pen is one specific vintage pen that is like really hard to find, isn't particularly valuable, super niche, but you just really want it bad and you pay for it and you don't love it, how easy is it for you to turn it around and sell it and then put it back into the rest of your collection if you are so inclined to do that? Um, I think that's something to consider uh, for sure. Um, and then, you know, have you had a chance to actually hold or write with your Grail pen first? Or is it just kind of your own perception or hype or uh, an idea in your mind that you have, like, I would really love this pen, but then you actually hold it and you're like, oh, this is really back-weighted and I just don't like the way this thing writes. That's a huge bummer, you know? Or it's like, oh, I really wanted this special nib grind, you know, if you're like, uh, you know, whatever, I really wanted this uh, specific kind of, you know, like Sailor, for example, has a lot of these really interesting nib grinds, King Eagle nib or something. You're like, I really wanted a, uh, 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 em you know, uh, n uh, no, not an emperor, king of pens. Sorry, emperor is Namiki. I really wanted a king of pens with a, a King Eagle nib. And then you get it and you're like, oh, this nib writes really fat. I can't really use this thing as much as I want to. Dang it. You know, that can be a disappointment kind of thing. So, you know, um, is the, are you going to be able to kind of Know what you're getting into first. Um, I think it depends on, you, you know, you fall into, you know, kind of one of two classes. Um, I think about people who are minimalists. Um, these are the people who will um, buy pens, and if they don't, if they're not in their regular rotation and using them every day or have some really meaningful significance to them, they will sell them, get rid of them, recoup what they can out of it, even if it's only 60% of what they paid for, and they'll apply it towards their next pen, whether it's expanding their, their collection, you know, breadth-wise or going deeper and more expensive. Um, I know plenty of people who will do that. They're like, I have a I have a 10 pen case, that's all I want it to be, and I will rotate things out until those 10 pens there are the absolute best 10 pens in the world for me. Totally cool. I support that and respect that a lot, actually, that discipline to be able to do that. Me? I'm not really able to do that. <laughs> I have a huge case over here filled with pens because um, just my style of collecting and um, just the, the referenceability and the accessibility of them. I'm, a, I'm an extremely tangible person. Um, I don't have a great verbal memory. So when I'm trying to think back of to like, oh man, like about pen details, I have an okay visual memory. But I'm trying to think back of like, yeah, you know what? How does the weight compare to, uh, you know, of like for example, you know, the Pilot Custom Urushi. I'm like, how how does the weight of this compare to uh, Visconti Opera Master? 
And I'm like, I can kind of remember, be like, man, I remember it was lighter. I don't remember how much, but if I pick up the pens and hold it, I'm like, oh, boom. Like it just triggers my memory immediately. So for me, I like to have a lot of pens on hand because it's easy for reference and that's just the way that I work. Not everybody's the same way. You don't may not have the same need to recall stuff like that, like I do, so it's not anything to worry about at all. Um, but me, it's like, oh man, was that pen eyedropper convertible? I'm trying to remember, but then I look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, absolutely. Like it just, boom, just holding it in my hand instantly triggers it back and I'm good. Um, so that's just my style. I'm, I am not a minimalist. I am more of what I would call uh, an acquirer or a collector. Yes, collector is just a more disciplined version of an acquirer. But acquirer is like I get pens and I generally hang on to them. I do not get rid of them in my personal collection. Of course, buying pens and selling pens is my day job, right? Like, and that's why this whole Goulet Pen Company exists. But um, in my personal uh, life here, I rarely sell or give away pens because it's just, it's part of my little collection, right? And I'm sure that I'll, it's gotta have a limit to at some point. I don't know where that is yet. I keep raising the bar <laughs> for myself there. Um, but uh, for me, just the way I started out is I went, I went incremental. Like I did kind of a blend of the two. I kind of fell, uh, um, fell into both camps. So um, for me, I started out really slow. I was getting like Noodler's Nib Creepers, you know, Lamy Safari, um, Pelican Script, the, you know, I'm thinking of some of my earliest pens, the Petite One, the um, uh, Kuwaiko Classic Sport, you know, just, just relatively inexpensive pens like that and kind of amassed a variety and collection of those. Part of that was because I just, I needed to get a breadth of fountain pen experience uh, just as a person who was in the business, right? Like, and I needed to kind of get it. I was getting asked about a lot of things. I'd never used them, so I kind of spread it around. Um, so for me to buy just random expensive pens didn't make a lot of sense for me at that time. I did do that a little bit. You know, I got into some gold nibs, but I went entry level stuff. Pilot Custom 74 was my first gold nib, and then it was a Lamy 2000, and you know, I kind of went incrementally there. Um, so that first year that I was in fountain pens largely was less expensive pens. I did do that first year, I did one kind of Hail Mary pass on a pen, not a pass, I'm thinking like football analogy now, but I did like one Hail Mary purchase, which was a Pelican M800 with a 1.5 millimeter stub. And uh, I, I had never used it before. I'd heard so many good things about the Pelican M800 and it was a blue version with the, I loved stub nibs. So I was like, oh my gosh, if I love a Pelican script stub, how much am I gonna love a 1.5 millimeter stub on an M800? Um, and I just, I had no experience with it. I just bought it. It was a stretch for me at the time. I got it, I had the wildest expectations and I got let down um, just because I didn't do my research. I didn't really know what I was getting into. I overbought on something that I didn't have proper expectations for. And even to this day, I just, you know, I've gotten over it now, of course, that was, seven years ago, um, but I have a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth just because of my own ignorance and lack of um, just awareness around what I was doing. Now, just like everything in the early days of Goulet Pens and my own experience, I've learned through mistakes, right? Like the first ink that I ever bought, I thought it was more saturated than it really was because I saw it when it was wet. I didn't see it when it was dry in, in a pen. That's why we sell samples now. That's why we have a swab shop. Like. I've taken a lot of those things and tried to use my own negative experiences, or not even truly negative, just you know, less than expectations experiences, and tried to turn those into, okay, what can I do to help you all have to avoid that so that you can go faster on the, the curve of, um, you know, the learning curve of getting into fountain pens and you can get quickly into the things that you really truly enjoy. Because, you know, there's kind of a, there's a, there's a hump you gotta get over a little bit with learning how to use fountain pens and stuff like that. But once you cross over that hump, like you find generally what nib sizes you like and what inks you like, you know, all this kind of stuff, then you just, your enjoyment level goes way up and you got a long, long life ahead of you enjoying fountain pens. Um, so I wanna try to shorten that life. Um, so, you know, uh, a little bit different experience that I had two years ago. So this is, I had a much more fountain pen experience under me. I had a much more of an idea of what I kind of liked. So um, I'd had on my radar the um, Visconti Homo Sapiens, right? Very common, um, you know, holy grail pen for everybody. Um, so for me, you know, I 
I waited until we actually started carrying the brand. I didn't buy it ahead of time. I knew based on demand how popular it was going to be, and I got to try them and stuff like that and hold them and all that. Um, but in terms of buying one for my personal collection and carrying it around, um, I didn't do that until after we actually started carrying the brand. And I took my time. I tried different nib sizes. You know, of course, I do like writing samples for the nib nook and all that kind of stuff, and I had to do all that. Um, but uh, I got to write with them all and really determine what it was that I was going to like. And then once I was able to do that, I knew that I was really going to enjoy it. And I've been enjoying it as a daily carry now for basically two years. So. Uh, I, I learned from my previous approach, it's not that I substantially did much different, I just had more awareness about it and what I was getting into. So um, for me personally, I think it's my own experiences, it was better to kind of build up and get into it. And I think if you have a minimalist approach, yeah, it'll take you a little bit of time to, you know, try out you know, higher and higher level pens until you kind of work your way up to a holy grail. Um, but I think that that in the end, will be better for you than just kind of, you know, just randomly buying pens you think you might like and then not. Um, but you certainly could, you know, like my Pelican Name 100, for example, I could have gotten that been like, yeah, this pen just didn't live up to my expectations. I could have sold it at 80% of its value right away, easily, um, and recouped most of that back and then applied that towards the next pen and really not have lost out a great deal. I would have learned, you know what I mean? Um, but you can bypass a lot of that if you are able to go to a pen show or do a pen meetup or maybe just link up with somebody online and do a pen swap or something. Um, it's harder to do pen swaps with holy grail pens, but um, you know, certainly you could, you could have some resources there to be able to try before you buy of sorts. Or if you, obviously if you have a brick and mortar store, you know, if you have a holy grail pen, and it's a $5,000 pen, they may not let you ink it up and try it, but you might be able to hold it at least. So you can at least try, educate yourself, read reviews, do all that kind of stuff, of course. Um, but there's nothing like actually having it and writing with it um, to be able to tell. So if you can do a pen meetup or something like that, that can help tremendously for anybody that has, and you can let them know like, hey, Visconti Homo Sapiens, it's my holy grail pen. Does anybody have one that I can write with that I can try because I really want to make sure that I know. That's a way that you can kind of skip some of the steps in that, that whole process that I just talked about. But um, that's, that's the approach I've taken. That's what I'd recommend. All right, next question is from Pedrojo on uh, Pedrojo30 on Instagram. Why pens with inner metal parts can't be eyedroppered uh, or converted to eyedropper? I get asked this a lot, you know, and man, I swear it's the funniest thing. Whenever I meet with a distributor or manufacturer and they show a new pen, literally the first question that we look at uh, is if, you know, they give us the information, okay, all this kind of stuff. Yes, price, color, availability, all that kind of stuff. But the first like kind of oddball question that's not part of standard fare that we always ask at Goulet is, can this pen be eyedroppered? Unless it's like completely obvious that it can't. Um, but we're like, hey, is this pen eyedropper convertible? And they're always like, oh, I don't know. No one ever asked that. And it's literally like we get asked this so much that it's just, you know, if we don't have that information firsthand, it's one of the first things that we test whenever we get a new pen in. Sometimes we get an announcement of a new pen. We don't actually get it until we, or we don't actually see the pen for ourselves until it arrives. Like, it's amazing that you would think like, wow, a retailer would carry a pen without even having held it first. Sometimes, yeah, we don't have a choice. It's very limited production, especially if it's a limited edition kind of thing. Um, it's very limited in production and, you know, it's going to come and go and be gone and, and literally like you'd be amazed. This is a little like, peeking behind the curtain a little bit on the retailer side of things. But sometimes we have manufacturers that reach out to us and they're like, hey, this pen has been announced. It's coming. Um, there's only going to be so many of them, um, and we need your order by this afternoon. And uh, other than that, they're going to be gone. So it's like if we want to even have a chance to have it, um, we have to place an order kind of sight unseen. So we have to really make educated guesses about how we think they're going to do. And then once the pen actually arrives to us, it's like a scramble to be like, how much does this pen weigh? Is it eyedropper convertible? Is it da 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 Can you swap nibs with anything? Because like none of that information... I mean, the weight, yeah. But none of that information about like how it's used and can you swap the materials and is the feed removable and all this kind of stuff, none of that is like standard information that's given to us from suppliers and manufacturers and stuff like that. It's all like super deep knowledge that, that we always try to acquire because you all ask us about it a lot. So um, anyway, all that to say, 
specifically here, if a pen has inner metal parts, we don't always know if it has inner metal parts because if it's a new pen that comes out, we literally have to like open it up and be like, oh, okay, like the custom Urushi, it's a big pen. You're like, oh, is this thing eyedropper convertible? Let me ask. Some of you might already be thinking that just from me talking about it earlier today. Um, and I look at it and I go, oh, boom, metal section right there, not eyedropper. And it's like immediately killer, right? Or I look in here and I kind of look in the back and I'm like, oh, I'm seeing some shiny stuff back there. And you know, pretty much anything that has a finial that has a separate kind of like trim piece or something like that, you can assume you might have some problems uh, eyedropper converting it because this is a separate piece here. Like the finial is a separate piece. It fits into the barrel that has the trim ring. So the trim ring is very thin. It fits over top of the piece that fits into the back of the finial. Like I can just tell you, I haven't taken this pen apart, but I know that's how it works. And I look in here and I can even see like, oh, okay, there's a notch right there. So there's a metal piece that, um, that screws in. That's how this finial fits into the back. And that's what's going on. Um, so yeah, there's metal parts back there that I can see. And then the most obvious that you get is metal um, sections right here. And they use metal in pens because it's very sturdy. It's very durable. But eyedropper convertibility is not universally worldwide like a deal breaker. So not all manufacturers care about that or do it or even test for that. It's very much like a hack, right? Some, some do that. Some design their pens. Noodlers, for example, designs all their pens to be eyedropper convertible, et cetera, et cetera. Not everybody does that. So like, for example, the customer Yurushi, not eyedropper convertible. Why? Well, it's got metal parts. Now I'm actually getting to answering your question here. Why is that a big deal? Who cares? It's got metal parts, whatever. Metal, metal's durable, metal can get wet. Well, the thing is, um, yes, that's technically true. And for the short term, you would be fine. However, you're dealing with ink. There are a few components to ink and ink formulas can be very different. Um, but uh, largely, you're dealing with metals here that uh, will corrode over time. Um, specifically with the ink, you know, some of the components of ink is salinity, so there's salt in there, and you deal with some possibly acidity, sometimes basic. Um, it depends on the ink, and they don't really provide that information. Um, so you deal with things that if it's directly dealing with corrosive metal, um, that can be a problem. Um, you know, for example, if you have brass or aluminum parts inside your pen, you're just not gonna be able to do it because what's gonna happen is it's gonna corrode the metal, which of course is gonna degrade the quality of the metal itself, but it's basically gonna rust and oxidize and flake off and provide flakes of metal crap in your ink that's then flowing through your pen. That's not gonna be good. So you don't want that. Long-term, it's just not gonna be good. Yes, if you're in a pinch for some reason and you say, this is gonna be a preposterous situation. Say I'm on a business trip and this is the only pen that I can get a hold of and I've lost my converter or it breaks and I, I just have to take notes for my next meeting and my phone died and there's no other pen around uh, and I wanna eyedropper fill this pen. Yeah, I can do that once. It's even got a little O-ring on here that fits on here. So um, it's tempting. Um, yes, I could eyedropper fill it. I could use this pen just fine for you know, a week or two or whatever. But if I use this for two years, eyedropper converted, I'm gonna get pitting and corrosion. It's gonna degrade the quality. And I would not wanna do that with a pen this expensive. Um, so you don't wanna be in a practice of doing that on a pen that has metal parts. And that is why. All right, I got two more questions and I have six minutes before my next meeting, so I'm probably gonna be late. We'll see how I do. All right, these last two are business questions. Oh boy, and I always ramble on these. <laughs> Evelyn Demers on Instagram, will you have a free shipping promotion anytime soon? Great question, Evelyn. This has been something that's been really hotly debated here at Goulet Pens. Um, I know that just in e-commerce in general, um, it's very common to have free shipping stuff. Um, and I won't go into great, great detail on it just because it's still like an open discussion. It's something that, it's not like fundamentally I disagree with, you know, giving value to you. Um, but the thing that I can say, anybody who's taken Economics 101, the whole idea of there's no such thing as a free lunch, uh, there is no such thing as free shipping. Shipping has a very real cost. Believe me, I know. It's one of the most, <laughs> you know, basically aside from, uh, uh, on a regular basis, aside from our products that we're purchasing, our cost of goods, and our people, basically the next most expensive thing is our shipping. Well, that's not necessarily true. Our rent and our website and all that kind of stuff. But shipping is up there. It's a very significant expense that we have. And if we just gave free shipping to everybody, we would quickly go out of business. I mean, just it, like free shipping to everyone, we would literally would, would not last long because there is a very significant cost to doing it. So if we give up free shipping, then we have to make it up somewhere. 
you know, literally, we have to make it up somewhere. We either have to have more expensive products, we have to do economies of scale, you know, encourage in a way to place larger orders so that our labor, you know, goes down and, and expenses and stuff like that goes down, um, you know, or we have to use it as a way to attract new business that we wouldn't have otherwise. You know, other than that, there's only so much you can do. You can, you can stop providing as good a service. We could stop doing educational things. I sit here for an hour every week and do Q&A plus the prep time and everything. Well, I could stop doing that. That's got a marketing component to it as well. So you could debate you know, where the value of that is. But anyway, um, it gets really muddy and gets really cloudy. And, and for us, we gotta be really intelligent about it. I know it's more common you see like a free shipping over a certain dollar threshold. Well, that's to encourage you to consolidate many of your smaller orders and place one larger order because it's a lot less labor and things like that. Um, you know, and it just allows for, to be able to make up some of that. But it's just unclear exactly how we do that. You know, I know from having done a bunch of research, you know, companies that offer free shipping and stuff like that, yes, it's a great incentivizer, but their margins are very, very low and they have to, have come up with really creative ways to make that up. A lot of brick and mortar stores that have online components to them, they will use the online store as a loss leader or use it as, um, you know, uh, uh, certainly not uh, the most most cost effective way for them to do business. They just, they have to do it to stay competitive or they use it as a, you know, as a component to their business and try and just keep the same customer, you know, all that kind of stuff. But if you're online only and you're doing free shipping all the time, it's tough. You get into a very, very low margin game, which means you're run, you're you're on thin ice like all the time. You got to be super smart and all that kind of stuff. So um, I know it's a great value. I know it's something that's really valuable. But we're trying to figure out how to be smart like for the long term. And it's it's I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the pressure. You know, of just like, dang, e-commerce is just like more people do free shipping deals than not globally. Just all all over e-commerce, and it's like. How long are we going to be able to not do something like that? So we're going to be really intelligent about it. I'm thinking about it a lot. I have to be smart and fiscally responsible for our whole company because I want to be around for the long term. I think you all want us to be around for the long term, especially if you're sitting here watching me in the tail end of an hour long video. Um, but you know, for the, for the honest truth, I want to be able to provide you all value, but I have to do it in a smart way that's not going to um, you know, be detrimental to the long term health of our business. So I'm going to be thinking about that. We as a team are talking about that. So we, you know, I can say like, it's not like next week, I'm gonna start doing a blanket free shipping on everything, you know, that kind of thing. That's not gonna happen, don't expect that. But if you start to see little levers that we pull here and there, little free shipping things on certain items or, you know, for a certain period of time, so through certain social media channels and stuff, we might be testing some of that stuff and just trying to learn and see what benefit there would be to us. Um, because I know the pressure is there from, from other retailers and stuff that are doing this for sure, like the struggle is real, I get that, that's very appealing and, and I appreciate that feedback. So tell me, tell me in the comments here, tell me, you know, tell my team, this kind of stuff and try to be like as literal and specific as you can. If you're literally like, I want free shipping, like, okay, yes, theoretically you do. But if literally like, hey, I really wanna buy this, but you know, to be quite honest with you, shipping is expensive, I live in California, your shipping is $9, whatever. And I'm, you know, this other retail is closer to me and the shipping is only $3 or it's free or whatever. And that's just really hard. I need to be able to do that. Can you, you know, whatever. Give us that feedback, it's super helpful. Um, and that's just kind of where I'm at. All right, last question for this week is Jeffrey S. on YouTube. Why did Goulet Pens decide to only sell fountain pens when all other retailers sell all types of pens? Is that a downside for Goulet since you're losing that business to the competition? Oh, this is such a good question. And I hate to feel rushed. I'm just gonna be late to my meeting because I don't care. I like this question a lot because I think it's really important that you understand why we're doing what we're doing here. So. Back when I was making pens, hand making pens out of wood uh, for Goulet pens, I didn't have anything to do with fountain pens. It was all rollerballs um, and ballpoints and stuff like that. I hated the way that the stock rollerball and ballpoint you know, refills that came with the kit pens that I was buying. I hated the way they felt. So literally, even before I knew anything about the writing community at all, just me as a manufacturer, a craftsman of these pens, I wanted to provide an enhanced writing experience. I wanted to provide the best writing experience that I possibly could. That's just the way I'm wired. You know, I never sold pen as art and was like, oh, whatever, who cares about the refill? It's just a collector piece. No, I really wanted these things to function. I'm a very utilitarian person. That's how I set it up from the beginning. So it was honestly through that pursuing better kind of a writing experience, that was early signs of what was to come. Like even, you know, it was really three years almost that I did that before really got into fountain pens. 
about two years, you know, 2007 to 2009. But the interesting thing was once I discovered fountain pens, it was like a switch flipped in my brain and I was like, this is what I've been looking for all along. I was trying to do these replacement rollerball refills and it was okay, but they would run out really quick and they would dry out and you know, all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, ah, well, this is the best that's there and this is better than ballpoints and all this kind of stuff. But then once I discovered fountain pens, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much better. You know, it's like if you've been, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a, a, an analogy to it. It's like if you've been, oh gosh. So some kind of food, I always go to food analogies. I don't know, it's like, okay, I got another analogy just because I, I love apples, right? I've loved apples my whole life. Um, that's actually, I talked about my diet thing uh, earlier in, in, this, in this thing, and that's one of the things that I actually get to keep because apples have a natural antihistamine. So my, my body literally craves apples because it's a natural antihistamine. Anyway, so I love apples. I grew up having red delicious apples all the time. And I'm like, oh man, I love apples, these are so great. And then literally it's like once I tried like Fuji and and Honeycrisp, you know, and Pink Lady and stuff like this. It was like, oh my gosh, I can't tell you the last time I've had a Red Delicious apple since I've discovered these other ones. I was like, there are so many better apples out there than Red Delicious. It's just like, I've had an awakening, you know? Okay, that's a terrible analogy, but still, uh, it was the same kind of thing when I discovered fountain pens. It was like, oh my gosh, the best writing rollerball refill doesn't even come close to these in terms of what I perceive to be an ideal writing experience. So um, that's just, that's immediately where I went. So it, I very much had like a conversion type experience and I was like, this is it. And then once I realized too, where their community was, like I was not alone. There were so many other people that had this same type of kind of conversion experience, especially if you would never grew up using fountain pens. It's a whole different thing when you used them in school and you had nuns slapping your knuckles and all this kind of stuff. Then you were having to like learn cursive and it was like you got PTSD from your early days of fountain pen use. And then you have to like, you give it up for 30, 40 years, and then you come back to love it. You're like relearning it. That's a whole other situation than I had, and I have talked to plenty of people that that's just your situation, um, which I think is a cool story in and of itself. But for me, it was, I never knew anything about them, and then I discovered them, and it was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And it was like, I never want to go back, really. And that's just kind of how it was. And just completely just went all in on fountain pens in the very beginning. Um, my roller balls just kind of fell away. And uh, especially there's a, there's a tight knit fountain pen community. Um, and really that's, that's kind of what it was. But it, even still, I was, I was, you know, when you start a business and you're, you're exploring, you know, I was making pens and that didn't work. So I went to retailing and pen, ink and paper and on the reviewing and all that kind of stuff. So I did a hard pivot at that time. So I, I am always thinking like, what if I have to pivot again? What if there's another leg of the business that could be different or grow or something like that? So even a number of years ago, this is like 2014, we came out with our, our mission statement, right? Like we actually defined what it was we were doing. Our original mission statement um, was to provide writing enthusiasts with the most personal online shopping experience through comprehensive education, exemplary service, and products we believe in. Um, now, it says to provide fountain pen enthusiasts with the most personal online shopping experience of the rest. So um, literally, we changed our mission statement about two years ago to more narrowly define it just to fountain pens. So that's an important distinction because really if you're if you are if you are in a position like i am i am the driver i embody what our company stands for for better or for worse i live that out and i represent that as ceo or the as what's called the cro the chief repeating officer like i need to know the mission statement and be able to say to my sleep because if i don't know it and i don't live it how can i expect my team to how can i expect them to make decisions based off of that if i don't live it out so i do i like breathe it right um but at the time it was writing enthusiasts so we we carried twisby pencils we were looking at you know other things like roller balls and stuff like that and we were like well they are for writing enthusiasts we do get asked about it you know if somebody really loves a lami safari maybe they will like roller balls or maybe they will i got somebody walking on the roof it's wigging me out <laughs> if you hear footsteps that's what it is um that or if i have um you know um uh you know pilot metropolitan or something like that that's actually a great writing roller ball same g2 refill everything it's a great writing pen and i'm like you know maybe there will be people out there that really like that so we tested it you know just with our most popular ones like the safari and the the g2s and and metropolitans i don't know if you remember this a couple of years ago but we, we did it we did that and so um we did it and it was a 
flop, just huge flop, especially the G2s, because they're everywhere. You know, it's like, why would somebody buy a G2 from us when you can buy them from Target and Walmart and Amazon, whoever? Um, so we just, it was a huge flop. Just everybody still loved the fountain pens, would ask us questions all day long about the fountain pens. They never asked us about rollerballs. Nobody cared. People would buy them here and there, trickling a little bit, maybe, but largely nobody cared. And it was, it baffled all of our distributors. Because, you know, for example, like, uh, you know, Pilot. You know, I toured Pilot's facility, Pilot USA, their facility. They have a 100,000 square foot warehouse and they have about um, 200 square feet of it devoted to fine writing fountain pens, right? The rest of it is all G2s and acro balls and bottle to pen and all of these just, you know, things that the majority of the country is writing with. The fine writing stuff is such, such a smaller portion of it. So we were, th we were thinking like, maybe we carry roller balls. Just Everybody uses them, but not our hardcore fountain pen fan converted, you know, fan base. Uh, and I think part of that is a bit of self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, that's just, that's, that's where I came from. And that was very much ingrained into the DNA of the founding of the Goulet Pen Company. Um, and so, of course, if we start selling other stuff after having done that for five years, it's just not going to really take. And yes, we could probably force it and, and do it over time and change our whole marketing structure and tactic and everything to try to do that. But it would really substantially change something. It would really kind of in the, in the business's sense, it would be us trying to be somebody that we're not. So really a couple of years ago, we said, you know what? We like our mission statement. It does help us a lot. But I mean, we true back to that mission statement regularly. I mean, literally we like on a daily basis. We're referencing some part of it when we were super thoughtful about creating it and that's why we did it that way so ultimately it was a huge decision for us to rein it in now of course if something crazy changes and we have some huge epiphany and we know we need to change a direction we can change it again like a mission statement is something that's really important and should help you drive decisions but that doesn't mean that you know if all fountain pens were eliminated from the earth we wouldn't say well we'll just go out of business then we would pivot we would do something different and change our mission at that point but for the foreseeable future our mission is fountain pens so because of that we then looked at rollerballs and we were like okay we're selling some yes some of our loyal fountain pen fans do buy rollerballs and use them or want to give them as gifts or whatever or want a set or something like that but that's just not what we're here to do you know the one exception the one exception that we have right now is glass dip pens. That's the only thing. We've carried them from the very beginning. And really the only reason we carry those is because it's a great way to test ink. So it really ties back to ultimately, I mean, there's not a lot of people that are using glass dip pens as a daily carry item, right? Like it's really to test ink. So it's almost more of an accessory for testing ink than it is itself as a writing instrument. That's kind of how we view it and how, you know, and it's such a small part, but if you really wanted to be a stickler, you could say glass dip pens aren't fountain pens. You shouldn't carry them. But I'm like, really, you know, okay. But still, that's like the one thing, but everything else, fountain pens telling you we've tried different things um, but the, the really interesting thing that I found and, and this has been confirmed by other people I've talked to Jake Weidman for example he's like man you know he went to the DC pen show as a first fountain pen show that he'd been to and he's doing his calligraphy and stuff like that and the fountain pen people you know he'd literally be like his oblique holder and be doing I mean he's a master penman one of the best in the world and he's doing this stuff and people would walk by and be like hmm, that's really nice and they'd keep on walking but then they would have like the really nice pens, like, you know, Kenner had like the Game of Thrones and like all these really like fancy pens, like limited edition stuff. And people would be like oogling over the pens. And he's like, this is such a weird experience because when he goes to calligraphy shows, nobody cares about the writing instruments at all. He's the rock star and people are like hanging on his every single pen stroke. And he's like, this is just so interesting being at a fountain pen show, how different the community is than calligraphy. And it's not that far of a step over, but you just cross that line a little bit and it's a whole different depth to the community. And that's, that's what I found. You know, people who use rollerballs are a completely different crowd than people who use fountain pens, than are people who use calligraphy, than are people who use pencils, right? Like it's all, then are people who use vintage typewriters or whatever, you know, it's like there's these very deep kind of niche communities and the chasm is is wide across these things it's really interesting so i don't know i think i think if we had a brick and mortar store would be very different because we'd have more foot traffic and we would have more um, people that are kind of casually coming upon us but for us 
for us what makes sense is to be hyper-focused. It ends up acting sort of like bumpers on our bowling lane, if you will, um, or we often call it our swim lane. You know, we stay in our swim lane. It's like, if I, if I start talking about pencils, I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. And you're like, he doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. And all of my credibility that I'm building for the last eight years in fountain pens goes out the window because I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to pencils. Okay, a little bit, but not much, you know? I, the, but there are people out there who are the Brian Goulet of pencils. Maybe even better, hopefully, you know? <laughs> but it's, uh, it's when, it comes to, when it comes to that, it's a whole new thing. You gotta learn a whole new depth. And I'm like, you know what? We're gonna stay focused. We're gonna go super deep, run just 100% fountain pens and be number one in the world on fountain pens. Because if I try and go into all these other areas, I'm gonna spread myself thin. And the phrase that I always like to use here, which is something I got from Jim Collins from his book, Good to Great, is um, we are gonna suffer more from indigestion as we grow than we will from starvation. And that has been so true. Because if we spread ourselves into multiple communities, we end up getting into things that we don't know that much about. We have a hard time understanding the community and the marketing and all that stuff. We have to relearn it all. And uh, we just don't know it as well. So being in the niche that we are, we're gonna be number one on fountain pens and drive hard towards that every single day and grow in that way until there's some crazy miraculous event that causes us to think otherwise. But anyway, that's why I do it. All right, question for the week this week. Um, I would like to do just a little bit of market research here, qualitative market research granted. Um, so how do you feel about free shipping? That's what I want to know this week. Um, not just in philosophical terms, but like literally, what is it that is incentivizing you to buy online when it comes to free shipping? Does shipping really make or break it for you? You know, are you commonly buying from places that do free shipping? Is it, what is it doing in terms of your behavior? Will you buy more just to hit free shipping? Uh, or is it you stick to loyalty first and if you can get free shipping, you'll do it, but you'll still buy, you know, I'm really curious to know. Um, uh, what it is. Will you actually save up placing an order and then buy it to hit the free shipping? I'm, just, I'm curious to know because I need to be really smart about any free shipping conversation that we have here at Goulet. And the more that you all can give me, um, the more intelligent I can be in making decisions as a business person. So that'll be my, my question of the week this week is a little intel gathering, if I appreciate that. Um, so that's it for this week. All right, I am super late to my meeting now, so I'm gonna run, but I hope you have enjoyed this Q and A. Um, be sure to leave me some comments here. Get ready for Halloween that's coming up. Get ready for Thanks giveaway that's starting. Get ready for Fountain Pen Day. It's going to be exciting. We're going to have a nice uh, fall. Uh, things are going to start to get really exciting in the fountain pen world. So I look forward to talking about it more. All right. Thanks so much for watching, and right on.